but not last lecture of the season. The programs committee has done a wonderful job this year and they've added a fifth lecture on May 12th with um, Suzanne Smeaton and she is a frame historian and the title of her lecture will be If Frames Could Talk and you can imagine what that could be all about. So that is May 12th, so mark your calendars. I do wanna let you know that any of you that are on this Zoom right now or in any previous one, you don't have to re-register. Diane has um, done a great job of putting all of you and maintaining a master list. So anyone that is, uh, has been on one before, you don't need to email the, K, uh, the Art League and let us know. Um, so uh, I do wanna add one quick little thing. Any of you that saw the October 21st lecture with Diana Greenwald um, from the, um, she's an assistant curator of the Isabella Gardner, Elizabeth Stewart Gardner Museum in Boston. And um, there's an incredible Netflix documentary about the biggest heist, art heist um, known. Um, and it happened at that gallery. And I watched the first episode last night and it's fascinating. It's a four part series. So if you have Netflix, be sure, I think it's called, This is a Robbery and it's world's biggest art heist. And it's fascinating because you see the inside of the Gardner Museum and all these incredible artworks that have been stolen. So anyway, check that out. And I want to encourage you all to keep checking our website. We're working very hard to keep it updated with lots of new things interesting things and things about our past speakers. So um, I just encourage you to check our website. Um, lots of things are changing. So with that, um, thank you all for joining us. And I will turn this over now to Kat, who will introduce our speaker. Good morning. I'm so pleased to introduce you to Dr. Gloria Groom. I love her work. The exhibitions she's brought to life are smart, thoughtful, and memorable. Dr. Groom is an internationally acclaimed scholar and author on 19th century French painting. She grew up in Tulsa, Oklahoma, received her PhD from the University of Texas at Austin and her degree in museology from La Col de Louvre in Paris. She joined the Art Institute of Chicago in 1985 and is currently chair of painting and sculpture of Europe and the David and Mary Winton Green Curator. She's played a part in the production of so many major exhibitions and catalogs featuring artists we're all familiar with. Gauguin, Redon, Renoir, Manet, Seurat, and toulouse lautrec I find her thematic exhibitions particularly interesting. I know many of you have seen Impressionism, Fashion, and Modernity, Van Gogh's Bedrooms, and Gauguin, Artist as Alchemist. The exhibition Manet and Modern Beauty was devoted to the little known paintings of pastels and watercolors of the artist's last years. It was among five finalists for the best exhibition of the year awarded by Apollo magazine. In September, after a four month delay, last year she opened Monet in Chicago, a celebration of the artist's impact on the city, including 34 paintings from private collectors in the Chicago area. This exhibit is up at the Art Institute through June 14th. Her current projects include an exhibition on Cezanne in collaboration with the Tate Modern, opening in May 2022, and in 2024, an exhibition on Edward Willard and the stage. I'm delighted to welcome her as an Art League featured speaker. Thank you, Kat, and thank you, Karen and Diane. I'm delighted to be here. I'm glad everybody has their coffee cups and their comfort of their own home, as I am too. Um, it's a pleasure. I'd much rather be in Kalamazoo, however. I'd so looked forward to driving up and having a good two days there. So that will have to come in the future. I'm going to share my screen right now, so bear with me because technology and I um, sometimes part ways. Are you seeing it? Because I can't see you. Okay, everything's good? Okay, great. Um, okay, so today what I'd like to do is... Um, walk you through some of the discoveries we've made, but also give you a little information about our current exhibition. So it's kind of be a, a kind of a um, combination in, and I'll make it so it's 40 to 45 minutes. So we have plenty of time to discuss later. No, I said it was slow. Oh, oh it's more. Um, and if, if, there, if there's something wrong, you, you can stop me. I don't know how you stop me, but I'm, I'm happy to be, it's unfortunately, we have to do it this way. Okay, I'm trying to get my screen to 
Okay, there we go. So here we are, very familiar to everyone. This is what we had hoped to be doing last workout. We had to wait until September 4th, which meant that um, the installation went on when we were home. So that was interesting. This is Monet in Chicago, the current exhibition. And just to let you know that and we had to reclose um, in January. And thankfully, it's an exhibition that deals with um, the paintings at the Art Institute, but also in private collections in Chicago. So as people said, when I called them up and said, you know, we need to keep your paintings on the walls because we hope to reopen. They were like, that's fine. Nobody's coming to our house. We're not doing anything. So that was kind of the perfect thing. Here's the cover of the catalog, just so you know uh, what it's about. And just to give you an overview, so 33 paintings from the, our permanent collection, along with 13 works on paper, and from Chicagoland, which means anywhere from Lake Bluff to Hinsdale, uh, 34 paintings, pastel and a drawing. So you can see that it's, uh, Monet looms largely, even though our collection was uh, very early on coming to the museum. And one of the things we wanted to do with the exhibition was to really, do three things. One was to tell the story of collecting Monet in Chicago. The second was to reveal some of the discoveries we've made over the years working on our online interactive scholarly catalog, which was launched in 2014, 2015. And the third was to show this dialogue of these Monets that are in our midst, but some of which we, many of which we did not know about and how put them in conversation with the classics, the iconic paintings in our permanent collection. Um, this was the idea for a permanent collection online interactive came from the Getty when they realized that these collection catalogs, which usually involve conservation and archives are wonderful, but they take years and years to do. And then they're so expensive that only research libraries buy them. And so they wanted to come up with a new idea and they chose nine institutions who would take on some part of their collection in a new format with a digital platform. And we were chosen and I was delighted. I was head of that project. And it was really interesting because we spent our money on, that they gave us quite a bit of money. Uh, we spent our money on getting a digital platform because none of us knew what we were doing. But what we had to teach this outside agency from the Indianapolis Museum of Art was how to do research and how we wanted the uh, books to be used. So we talked to them about here's a typical um, here's a typical catalog. And then we talked to them about the act of research. What are we looking for? The kinds of archival, biographical, conservation, library. And, how, and we chose Monet because we had the most of that impressionist artist. So we started there. And um, it is something that I hope you will play with after this lecture because it is, um, it's the Cadillac. After that, of course, the funding ran out and we still do these online scholarly catalogs, but Monet, because we had the Getty money um, is really the catalog rather, catalog, rather, uh, Cadillac rather than the, um, the Honda. Um, so, so what did we learn? So we brought some of our discoveries to the exhibition. And this was, I think, one of the early revelations of this painting in our collection since 1933, the beach at San Andres, one of Monet's early uh, paintings of the area around La Havre where he grew up before he came to Paris at the age of 18. And we've always thought of this painting as being uh, a kind of a yin yang pendant to the one at the Met, which is exactly the same size from the same summer, showing leisure class, showing the tourists who are coming to this village. And as you can see, the white sails of the sailboats uh, in, in uh, contrast to the dark sails, which mean these are the working boats, either the fishing boats and the main um, subject of the painting are the fishermen who work the, uh, the coastal. But we found that Monet had different ideas for this, this painting. Um, and I'm hoping this will work. Yes, good. And so what I'm doing now is what you can do online, showing this painting as we delve beneath the surface and we look at it in the different lights from natural light to x-ray to infrared transmitted, all of these tools we can talk about later that come from medical profession that now are used in art. And so the red outlining is what you can't see with the naked eye. So as you'll see, there's something going on there's more sails in orange and there's people wearing top hats 
and at the right hand side of this painting that you don't normally see. You can see the outlines that we have outlined for you, but you can see them in this um, transmitted light. And so what happens is that Monet originally thought of this as going to be those tourists who were coming to the beach at San Andreas. And then for whatever reasons decided that he was changing his mind and the fishermen that you see on the left were actually painted over the sand. So they were a late addition. So it completely changes the way we think about Monet as an artist who paints a la prima out of doors that this is what he gets. But no, I mean, he's an artist that starts out of doors. Certainly he's an impressionist, but then the actual painting is memory and imagination and changes and struggles inside the studio to get to the final one. So actually this started out to be much closer to the subject that you see in the Mets painting. And just to give you an idea of how this catalog works, I don't like uh, digital publications because they jump around. And I wanted this to look like a book so people feel comfortable. And that's what we, we've got. You can always return to the image in the top right. You never get lost. It's um, not something that you have to scroll backwards. You can just simply pop on things the same with the uh, footnotes. So it's been, it's been very successful in terms in the colleges, but um, I still think it's not very well known. And one of the things we wanted to do was to gather all of the different kinds of uh, signatures. At the end of his life, as you know, anything that was left in the studio was given a studio stamp, but these art paintings were not left in the studio. They were not late acquisitions. And so they have the actual um, signature of the artist. And we also were happy to look at the works on paper that he did in our collection. Uh, was given in 1933 by the former mayor, Carter H. Harrison, 10 of Monet's caricatures that he did when he was 15 and 16 years old, when he was still living in La Havre, and he was trying to make money. And people always say, you know, oh, Monet, he can't paint figures. He certainly doesn't do figures in, the, in his impressionist stage, and figures are just there to give scale to the landscape because he's really a landscape painter, but he could. And these are certainly uh, evidence of that, that he was doing caricatures, kind of like the kind you see at Montmartre now, of different lawyers and politicals in the area, and he was getting paid 15, 20 francs. And so um, this was a way for him to make money. But I also think it's just um, amazing. And it's funny that when Carter Harrison bought these in 1922, he tried to return them to the dealer because he thought he had been swindled because they were signed O. Monet because Monet's name was Oscar Claude Monet. And he dropped Oscar, thankfully, when he came to Paris and became an artist with the younger Impressionists. Uh, but and so. Anyway, they are very much his and they're very rare and we don't get to see them because they're on paper. These were blue paper and now the papers faded to a kind of dusty brown. But um, so it's wonderful to have them out in the exhibition that we're doing now. Another one of the discoveries that we show in the exhibition uh, is this one. This is another early painting. So the year after the beach at San the on the banks of the San Benacour, a painting that's the only one that survives from the summer when he was staying across the Seine. So if you look across, you see those two little figures that are drawing. Um, when he was staying with his girlfriend, Camille, who becomes his wife and their nine month old baby. And because he could not pay the rent of the hotel he was staying in, he, the, um, the owner kept his paintings and most of them just, just were destroyed except for this one. So this one is really a prize. It gets asked for for every exhibition, but you can see with the naked eye that there's something going on. First, you realize that she, Camille, is painted completely over the grass. The river runs through her bodice. The green is part of it. So she was a latecomer. She was not left in negative space, but rather a latecomer to the scene. And then near her bodice, if you look slightly to the left, I don't think you can see my cursor. It'd be great if you can, but I'm going to go ahead and pretend you can. There is some kind of a face. You can see the flesh color of it in the reflection of the house across the way. Um, this There's a hole over to further to the right, which is actually um, a puncture, somebody, you know, mis mishandled this painting. And then, um, but you can see that there's something going on. And this is a very strange white um, big something is on her lap. And it's all very just, it works from a distance, but it's all very confusing. 
And we thought, oh, good, now we're going to find out what he really wanted to do. So we looked at it under the X-ray, under transmitted light. Um, and and under, interestingly enough, we really couldn't see any more than we can see now. And I put a little blue halo around that face with the um, with the flesh color. And I think it might have been another figure. There might have been two figure in the banks went extended further out into the water. Um, it's kind of big for a nine month old baby. And that might be a dog. Uh, it's, it's very confusing. It all works beautifully. But when you start to take it apart, but this is an instance where even with all our wonderful tools, we still can't figure out more than you can see just by putting your nose as close as you can get before the guards will tell you to stop. In 1890, as you know, so many years later, by the 1880s, I should say, Monet was making money. Um, the Paul Durand Royal Gallery, his dealer and the Impressionist dealer had moved one gallery to New York and the people like the Havemeyers in New York, the Bostonians, the Chicagoans were buying mostly in Paris, but a lot in New York. And so his um, fame and his economic situation had greatly changed. And he was able to rent the property and buy the property as Giverny by 1890. And this is the poppy fields that are, that are outside his home, which I'm sure many of you have visited in Normandy. And this is a great example of, yes, he was an impressionist. Yes, he painted out of doors because we actually found the organic evidence of a blade of grass and the evidence of, a, of some kind of organic matter having been there and been pulled off. So he's painting wet on wet, he's painting out of doors and on a, on a you know, in any day when there's wind or anything, things are gonna fly into the canvas. And here we have a wonderful example of that. We, and also this painting is really interesting because we have looked beneath the surface with the different lights I've talked to you about. And we found that there was another, like the Beach at San Andres, there was another composition that he originally started from and scraped back. So like Beach at San Andres, you scrape it off, you paint over. So we no longer see that, but like emails that never really disappear, you can always get them back we can bring them back with these different light tools. And you're seeing kind of a um, kind of a mountain range or something. So we've looked at the paintings that he was also doing at that time. And we were find that there's, so you can see the composition. We find that there's a number of works that could have been in play at that time and that this might've been part of another series. And then he completely, rethought what he wanted to paint. And this is just showing you what he was looking at when he's painting these cliffs at uh, Etretat, which is Normandy. And I should say that he went back almost every summer to the area where he uh, feels most comfortable, the area where he lived. And so you get a lot of these wonderful um, Etretat around these sort of sublime. And as you'll see on the, the painting on the right, um, there's tiny little people on the very, oops, right-hand side of this, for you, just to give you scale. Again, not a painter so much of figures. You saw the figure of Camille, you saw the fisherman. They're really just ciphers to give scale to the, uh, to the composition. And one of the things that helped us to determine that those canvases I've just shown you from Etretat might be related are the fact that they're on the same canvas. And you can tell canvases often have the stamp because they were, on rolls and then they would be pre-stretched and primed and the artist would buy it ready to go, but they would have the canvas stamp with the address of the uh, merchant, of the purveyor of the canvas. And those did, and this is what, this canvas as many of our 33 has been relined, but when you blast it with that light and that infrared from the backside, you can sometimes pull up the, um, the, the residue, the vestiges of the earlier uh, canvas stamp as we were able to do here. And so just kind of pull it up. And um, this is very technical here and I'm gonna go very quickly, but these cliques represent the same canvas. That means the warp and the weft of the canvas weave and the number of uh, threads for each, which we've done through algorithms through another agency that does that for us, has determined that these canvases belong to this purveyor and that these were from the same 
bolt. So it'd be like the same bolt of canvas. So that's why in our collection alone, we were able, because we have 33, we were able to determine that these belong together. And as you can see, like in clique one, you can see that they're oftentimes, they're not exactly placed. This is opposite, you know, that he's used the canvas, but the canvas is upside down because he's buying them pre-stretched. And so he takes what he gets. And, but it really does help you to understand what could have been done. And this is just an example where he's lost his canvas. It's flown into the ocean. And he says, you know, get me trois gras, trois gros, which is one of the uh, purveyors and bring me some canvas. You know, he has specific materials by this time. He's being paid by his dealer, not only to travel, but his dealer is buying the materials that he needs. And so he's got kind of this thing going. He's going on campaigns to bring back series of paintings that he will show uh, to the Parisian public and that will be taken to New York to sell also to Americans. And this is just another example of the kinds of purveyors who, you know, it's kind of like a fa family dynasty and they move on and they move to different parts of Paris and he is very loyal to Trois-Croix. And these are the different suppliers and you can see the very bottom one. Um, and it's fun to trace back where he is because you can almost trace the suppliers by where he is living at the time and where it's most convenient for him to get them. But Emilio Eklund in Venice, that's the only time he uses this purveyor because he is in Venice. Um, with his second wife for a very short time, but during that time he wants to paint and he does a series of almost postcard-like iPhone kind of uh, topographical. So in the exhibition, we also wanted to get into these series paintings, those paintings that he starts in 1891, 1890 with the stacks of wheat, then he does a series of London, and then he does the almost 300 different paintings based on the water lily pond at Giverny. And if you come to the Art Institute, and many of you do, I hope, you know that we own the largest amount of the series of Meule, which is the stacks that we're showing you here. We own six. The Orsay is famous for its four cathedral paintings. Museums tend to have like their, their strength. Um, and these have come to us over the years from a number of uh, uh, de uh, collectors, but most importantly, the Potter Palmers, the Palmer House across the street from the Art Institute, which is sadly closed now, but which started up after the fire. Uh, this was the great couple, the power couple. He was a great philanthropist. She was a grand dame and the hostess to the world during the, uh, night, during the 1893 Colombian World's Fair. And here, as you say, you know, is she the only American woman who knows how to spend a fortune? She would buy her dresses in Paris. She would buy her her paintings in Paris. And she really considered herself um, sort of the discoverer of Monet as she was looking for paintings for the women's building in 1890s, preparing 1891, preparing for the 1893 Columbian World's Fair. She amassed a huge collection and her claim to fame is to have gone to the first exhibition in 1891. So right after Monet has finished, the 25 stacks of wheat paintings. He shows 15 at his gallery in Paris. She goes to it and in that year and a half, she buys five. So she really understood what was radically new and different, the idea of focusing on one subject, different times of day, and just this banal subject of these 16 to 18 foot high stacks of wheat that were outside his home in Giverny. And she brought them home and she added them to her collection of Barbizon paintings, but more and more it's becoming the avant-garde of the Impressionist because she was truly, in terms of quantity, she was really one of the great collectors. And that's what sets Chicago apart from Boston and, Mo and New York who had amazing collectors, but not in the kinds of quantities that she did. And in the exhibition, you get to experience that. We have our collection on view in one room, kind of as it would have been seen in 1891 when she visited. And this is just to give you a view of these, how what he was painting. Um, they're, they're tall. I mean, they're 16 to 18 feet tall. And for Monet, they represented sustenance. They represented the rural agricultural uh, culture that was fast leaving uh, France and becoming as it became more and more industrialized. 
And even these, and we have six of these, as I said, that were given starting in 1922 with the one that Mrs. Potter Palmer gave us. But even these, which look so simple and you think, okay, so he's going out and he's painting what he sees and he's doing it at different times a day and different times of the season he does. He works from the fall of 1892, March when he exhibits them in 1891. But even these, the red is showing you the many different changes that he made to these stacks. Uh, sometimes adding a stack and then just scraping it out. Um, they're not just what you see is what you get. He would take them back into the studio where he would rework them. And in his own terms, he said he wanted to harmonize them into an ensemble, into an installation, um, which very few people understood except for Bertha Palmer. And I'm just showing you one of the many discoveries we made when we were looking at these. And we could do a whole exhibition of these because they're exciting. So this is a, a painting that entered the collection in 1933. Um, and I'm just showing you what happens. Do you see that there is another stack, a little stack to the right? Let me go back. It goes kind of quickly. Um, that was comes there and then he paints it out and he uh, it becomes what you see with the naked eye. And then there are other changes that he makes. So in where the paint is slightly cracked up, you can see underneath there's a green palette. So we think probably this was started at a slightly different period. And then he decided, oh, you know, I'm gonna add the white, I'm gonna add a snow because it's gonna fit in better with what I'm trying to do. The other series that we looked at in the exhibition and in this catalog of our collection is the London series and the water lilies. So in London, Monet, as you'll remember, his wife dies, his first wife dies. He starts up um, a relationship with his uh, best collector's wife. His best collector goes bankrupt. He's kind of out of the picture. Elise Hoshide and her six children and Monet's two children all move in together outside of Paris and Vitoy and eventually Giverny. And in 1900, they go to 1899, 1900, they go to London to visit their, his son, Michel, who's studying there. And that begins a three year campaign. He only goes to London in February or in March when there's no tourists because it's not fun, it's not beautiful weather. And the fog and the smog is at its best because for him, that's what makes London wonderful. And by this time, so now we're 10 years past the stacks, he's working in series, he's thinking serially, but he's also dissolving rather than showing things more and more abstract. He's now dissolving what he's, these stone structures into this mass of paint and he's become so confident. And as you can see, his palette has changed radically from what we saw on the beach at San Andres, which was more naturalistic, more descriptive. And now it's pinks and lavenders and acidic greens. It's just incredibly um, magical and poetic and symbolic, which was where he was moving since eight, nine, 1899, eight, uh, 1900. And he does these different bridges because he's staying at the Hotel Savoie, Savoie, so absolutely his economy has changed. And he's taking on these iconic bridges, the Waterloo Bridge and the Charing Cross Bridge from his fourth floor window at the Savoy Hotel, where he returns at three different times, always at the same time of year, uh, just showing you in the red square up here. This is his hotel. This is the Waterloo Bridge. This is the Westminster Bridge. This is the Charing Cross Bridge. So he's got this kind of a viewpoint. Um, sometimes Alice is with him, mostly not. Most of the time he's writing to her and saying, well, I need to stay another month. You know, it's just so difficult. I've got to capture what I see. And uh, I'm thinking of her with her eight uh, children and thinking, you know, really? But, and his dealer was also pushing him. He wanted him to show these because he knew they'd be a huge success. But Monet took his time. He would bring them back and he would work on them in Giverny. And then he would return to London with canvases and start new canvases. So he had a process that he was not willing to let go. His early ones um, are, really are more descriptive in some ways. And then he gradually moves into this phase of dissolving the imagery. And you can see uh, on the right, you can see the changes that even in these simple dissolved paintings he makes from the original 
painting that's underneath that he scraped off and reworked. Um, this is showing a, a signature that barely that he's painted over. He would usually sign his paintings only when they left his studio uh, for uh, to be sold or to be on an exhibition. And this is the Waterloo Bridge showing just the oldest bridge in, in London and what he does with it and how he's just barely. What's wonderful about these paintings is that the most tangible thing is the smoke. The thing you would, you know, the most ephemeral becomes the most paint laden. So there's the impasto that he's everything else. These other buildings are kind of just breathed on. And he says, you know, just imagine I'm bringing back eight full crates of canvas, 80 canvases. And if I had only had the right idea to begin with, this would have been done. But now, you know, every time I start, I have to make, you know, start over again. I've made progress, but uh, the paintings, it's never easy. People think that after 50 years of painting, Monet must know exactly what he's doing. Yes and no, he does. But at the same time, he's constantly challenging himself, himself for new motifs, new ways of approaching um, the pictorial vocabulary he's using. And so it's a struggle. And again, writing to his wife, you know, got to stay a little bit longer. And here's the transmitted. So from the back with infrared, you're seeing the changes. The big down the middle is simply a stretcher bar. Um, again, with the x-ray. X-rays are really hard to read and I read them with the conservators at my side. So I know this is probably very difficult for you. Let me just show you in the outlining what you're seeing that those red marks are what he started out with in this composition. And here you see our, again, our Waterloo Bridge and our, but what I wanted to show here was again, that idea of making the things that are the least palpable, the least material become the subject. And that's, these little arrows are pointing to the headlights. They're probably carriages, cars. There are cars at this time, but it's most likely the, the kind of um, lamplight that you would get on the carriages. And just to show how confident he is and how many colors are going into this idea of light itself. Um, as opposed to the bridge and the smoke, everything is just sort of breathed on, as I said. And I love to make this comparison with these lights on the bridge, with the, the way he's treating the woman's hat. This is the light, this is her hat, and this is the painting that that comes through um, in 1882, so much earlier. But these ideas of these just smushes of paint that he's so confident in doing that he uses, it can be a woman's hat or it can be the light of a carriage, doesn't matter. Um, as I said, he is painting the Houses of Parliament is part of this series. So it's Charing Cross, it's Waterloo. And then the last part in 1900-1901 is his series of 33 paintings of the Houses of Parliament. Now, again, the signature does matter. So we've been able to see the, the earlier signature, but then showing that he goes back in the studio and he repaints it. And by the time it actually goes to the exhibition, there is another signature that has taken that place. He shows them all together, finally, uh, not until 1904. Meanwhile, his dealer is like, come on, I've given you the money for these trips. I bought the Pinterio, come on, do something with it. And he shows the Ville de la Camise à Londres. Uh, and you can see 18 Waterloo bridges, 11 houses of parliament. So this must have been an incredible exhibition. And um, the reviewer of it said he wanted to explore the unexplorable and express the inexpressible, which I think is just such a beautiful way of talking about these these bridges, these iconic features of, of London that have been dissolved in paint. And that also holds true in my thinking for the last series that he would work on, which was the water lilies. And this is the last gallery of the exhibition that I've been alluding to throughout this, this uh, lecture. Now, if we had not been in COVID times, I had to make a lot of compromises with this exhibition. I had hoped that we would have this room where the lighting would be so dramatic and you would only see these spotlit and you would be having these benches where you could just sit and contemplate and think about how he made them and why he made them and what the emotional impact is. Of course, we can't do any of that. We have no benches. I've spread out the exhibition so that actually it works really well because every 
painting has its own psychic space. So you never are near people as you're looking, as you can see in this installation shot. Um, so it, it works in some ways, but it's still an exhibition that had to take place and thankfully did take place because it's local lenders um, with some huge rules and regulations to make it possible to reopen. Um, as I've said, those were the three series and the Water Lily series, which was his magnificent obsession. If you think about him buying the property uh, by 1890, so by the time he's rerouted the river, he's built the Japanese bridge, so it's 1899. So from 1899 till his death at age 86 in 1926, he works on water lilies with few trips, like a trip back to London. Uh, but most of the time he is cultivating in a kind of Voltairean way, his own garden, which becomes the motif that he is now going to enter into and own just as he owned the motifs of the stacks of wheat. And just as after three years of going to London, he felt that he owned that, those scenes. And here you see just a detail, but again, showing the scumbling and the starting over. And it's not just one layer of paint, it's letting the paint dry, it's revisiting it, it's rethinking it in terms of other paintings. This is just a detail. But again, that kind of confidence as he layers on colors for these water lilies. Um, this is a detail showing the, um, you know, just the impasto that he's using in this most um, almost ephemeral way of showing the water and the reflections from the banks and the growth, the undergrowth, the aquatic flowers that, and plants that are growing up. So you're seeing both top and bottom and there's no horizon. So they're becoming more and more abstract. We show that, and this is an example of that immersive room where you would have seen the, the information about the stacks of wheat, you'd see about London and you see about the water lilies where we really show how they were built up and what they look like. This is an X-ray showing how he's added and then scraped out many more water lilies. In 1920, Martin A. Ryerson, who was with the Potter Palmer family, a great supporter of the Art Institute, one of the le leaders of the Columbian World's Fair in 1893, who also, and probably because of the Potter Palmer starting to collect avant-garde art, which would be Impressionism, started collecting in the 1890s, going to Paris, not meeting Monet, however, until 1920, when he and his wife went on a mission from the Art Institute supposedly with $3 million, I don't think so, to buy 30 water lily paintings. I think it was probably more like $300,000. Maybe somebody made a mistake with the zero. But um, at any rate, he goes there with this mission that we're going to have these 30 paintings coming back. And Monet says no. Monet, by that time, is a very wealthy man. He has eight gardeners. He's got everything he needs. And he knows that he is the national treasure, as well as being recognized in the United States. And he's been, um, he is now working on the water lily cycle that he will give to the state that he starts at the beginning of the war, that he says, I want to do something I want. I want it all to be seen together. And these monumental paintings that he will give to the state and that become part and that are now seen in two oval rooms beautifully installed in the Rangerie, which is part of the Musée d'Orsay, as you know, on the other end of the Tuileries Gardens towards the Place de la Concorde. And here you see what he was working on. And so the studies and the preparations for this, he had in his studio and he was not going to let them go. In fact, only about five during that period of some 15 years get, leave his studio. As I was saying, he builds his own Japanese bridge, the wooden bridge, and he starts painting that. And we have one in our collection. You can see how they, are, they go from being very descriptive, so you really know where you are, to be more and more um, abstract. And I'm going to take a detour here because this is a recent discovery of my own that I love. When I was visiting um, my son, he happened to be at New Hampshire, in, actually in Dartmouth, I met the mother of the Americans who owned the nursery that was the nursery from which 
Monet bought his water lilies. And this had gone back since 1875. And at the World's Fair in 1889, they presented the hybrid water lilies. Until that time, water lilies had only been white in France. And this nursery hybridized the American, South American um, water lilies so that there'd be fuchsia and yellow and all of these colors that uh, they were able to get. And Monet saw them at this exhibition, met them. And by the time he was ready to plant his water garden in 1899, he ordered all of what you're seeing here, 1894. He's ordering these, um, the lotuses, the water lily. Fortunately, lotuses didn't grow very well. They were harder to keep up. And so the water lilies won out and that's why. And this is a 1904 order from him, the deep red, pink red, deep red. And so this nursery, which is actually closer to Bordeaux than it is to Giverny, so it would have been a train ride, was furnishing him. And we can still go there and we can order the actual water lilies that, that um, Monet used. And I think it's fantastic that it was owned for years and years and years by the French, briefly by the British, and then an American couple bought it. And that is the, those are the owners today. And in the exhibition, you can see ours on the left and the right hand side, and then one from a private collection in the middle, but showing just how he goes from the more representational to the more and more abstract. And he's working on these square formats, which becomes his preferred format, um, because it makes him think differently about the window onto nature, that kind of rectangle. When you're working with the square, you're already working with a kind of decorative symmetry that he exploits to the fullest by showing us the reflections from the banks, as I've said, and from what's growing up. And so you have just this wonderful moment where you're lost. And because you're lost, you are able to just enjoy the paint itself and the emotional impact that it has on you without the narrative that you see in the one on the left, for example. So these are the kinds of things that the discoveries we bring out into the exhibition that the exhibition, but also in the online scholarly catalog. And in the exhibition, the third point I wanted to make. So the first is the collectors and how things got to Chicago. The second is the discoveries made in the laboratory as we look beneath the surface. And the third, as I mentioned, is the dialogue that our collection has with these, collect these private collectors. And I'm just showing you some of the paintings that are in the exhibition from private collections. They don't, they don't actually mimic what we have in our collection, which is wonderful, but yet they show the range of Monet as he goes on these different campaigns. The one on the top left, for example, the two on the top left are from um, the, the Riviera, the French Riviera, where he goes in the early 80s. You've seen the ones from Normandy, and then he has the ones along the Seine. Um, these are, again, some of these have been in Chicago with the Potter Palmer family since 1891, and they've never left the collections. And so that's wonderful. They aren't in our collections yet. Maybe they will be. The one I love the most is the one, the second from the left on the top row, which shows his extended family, at least five of the eight, in those fields that were you saw for the poppy field and for the stacks of wheat. And it's a perfect example of why people don't matter. He's really not a figure painter. These, these ch children have no faces. They kind of glow. They're kind of children of the corn. They're kind of creepy. But I love it because it was painted two years after the uh, Sunday on La Grande Jatte. And it's got the same complementaries, the blues and yellows, these colors that quiver when they're put side by side. And the people are just kind of cookie cutter like. And that's exactly what happens in the Grand Jatte when, when Seurat tries to make something monumental and for the museums out of a modern life scene. So, that is our exhibition. Those are just some of the discoveries we have. And I do hope that you will able, be able to make it to Chicago before June 14th, because this exhibition has gone on for the longest time in any in our history, but not consecutively. We've opened, closed, we've opened again, and hopefully we'll be able to leave it up until then. Thank you. Back again. 
Does anyone have any questions they'd like to share or to um, ask? You can either use the chat. I think um, Gloria, could you, uh, Gloria, um, do you, Gloria, do you see the access to the chat? Yeah, I do. I do. I can, I can see that Paula wants to know how long it's open. So another um, till June 14th. So, you know, what, seven weeks, eight weeks. Um, yes, and you've answered Kat. Okay, great. Any other questions? I, sometimes it takes a while because I, I speak too quickly perhaps and it's morning and I've had my coffee, but. Um, fascinating, absolutely fascinating. I have a comment and a question. Can you hear me? Yes, I can. Um, it's always exciting when myths are dispelled and you just did that for me. I was always thinking that Monet just painted what he saw right there. I'm just curious if, if other impressionist artists also did the same thing in your knowledge, uh, readjusted and re adapted what they saw and then took back to their studio and did something else to it. I think you're absolutely right. I think they all did. I mean, there are a couple of paintings in the exhibition that are not from our collection that you think they're one-offs and they might be. They're kind of left at a very unfinished stage um, where you can just see that he's just getting down the light dark, the, the general idea. And then for whatever reason, and these paintings tend to be stamped with the studio stamp because they were left in his studio and they weren't, for him, they weren't finished. Um, so, and, and that's interesting. And that's another reason to come to the exhibition because you're gonna see things you're not gonna see again because they're in private collections. And some of these people are new, collect, new to collecting and um, they were a little, you know, they had trepidations, but they figured it's down the street. It's not going anywhere. It's not going overseas. And so, you know, it's, it's a really good opportunity to peek into someone else's collection, but also to see the, as I said, the range of Monet, the, 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 the thing that makes the Chicago's collection special besides the quantity, because we had probably by 1933, which was the a Century of Progress exhibition, we probably had 95% of our collection. And we've only bought two paintings out of the 33 that we own. So these were all phil philanthropic gifts. And there's a promise gift in the exhibition, you know, somebody that's already said they'll give it to us later. So it's, uh, it's really an opportunity to, to see why our permanent collection is different. And that's because, as I mentioned, People like Bertha Palmer or Martin Ryerson, they were buying paintings that he, that while he was still alive and that he considered really important enough to exhibit. And some of them were off the easel, maybe, you know, they just dried. Uh, so it's not what's left in his studio when his son, his ne'er-do-well son, Michel, the racetrack driver, um, starts selling everything off in the 1950s. Uh, it's, it's not those, and those have the stamp. Hello, yeah. I have a question. Sure. Um, I, I believe this is in the Musée d'Orsay. Um, it's um, a painting of Monet that shows movement. There is a, maybe just one woman or a daughter or something, they're coming down a hill. They're dressed alike. And so not only is it a series, but you have movement of the, and I think when they come over the horizon, maybe children follow them. Are you, are you familiar, or, or maybe it's not Monet? I think, that's, I think that's Renoir. I, okay. I know exactly which one you're talking about, and the grass seems to be moving with them. And yeah, yeah, excuse me. Real... Yeah, but I, yeah, and I also enjoy the magpie. It's one of the favorite of Monet's. Ah, I, every time I go to the Louvre, I have to see that. So good story about the magpie. So I don't have the, an image of it, but it's this beautiful snow scene. Um, and he did snow really well. You don't see it as, you know, we don't think of him, but when he did do snow, he did it well. And it's, it's just like sun on snow with this single magpie sitting on a, a gate. And it's really, and that was for sale and we wanted to buy that. And it was, the French preempted it. You know, the French will stop things at the border if they think they belong in France. 
And I think they felt that America has enough. And um, so they ended up having to raise the money, which they eventually did, although I don't think they raised as much as we were willing to pay. Uh, so that might, so that was one that got away uh, because it was so, it was so different than anything we had. We, we, we tend not to want to buy Monet's, but that was spectacular. Thank you. Was Monet going blind at the end of his life? Um, he had cataract. Um, so from probably the last 20 years of his life, he was one of the first to have cataract surgery on one of his eyes. And it did help. But the problem is, as you know, when you do one eye and then the other eye, then he, then he saw double. So he got back the ability to see colors, which he had lost. He could only see certain range of colors and he he would, you know, memorize how he laid out his tubes on the on the on the shelf and on the palette. Uh, so he gets back and but then it affects the way he sees he sees double. Um, but he's able because he's you know, it's muscle memory for him. This man has done painting for over 50 years and uh, there's you know, there's there's a kind of memory that allows you to um, paint without looking like you don't have your eyesight anymore. So he definitely had compromised eyesight, but unlike Duga, who really did kind of go blind, um, he still has aspects of vision. Well, you've been a wonderful, wonderful audience. Um, it's so hard to to relate. I'm, you know, on a screen. It's just like not what we should be doing. But at least we can communicate, and at least we can talk to each other. Um, but definitely, I hope this is my last Zoom um, presentation for the Kalamazoo Art League. Well, thank you. Thank you. Ordinary. I have heard many, many lectures about art in various uh, capacities, but this was so fascinating. I had no idea. And I think everyone was probably just as surprised as I was to see that the x-ray. And I, you know, when I look at those paintings again, they'll, I will just be having my eye right on the canvas. As you say, though, you can't get past the guards. So yeah. we, it really helped to see what you had produced. Um, Thank you, thank you so much. This was just a remarkable um, exhibit and we hope you do stop in Kalamazoo. Um, we're a wonderful little community. So thank you, thank you very much. Okay, I wish everyone a good day, good health and hope to see you again. Thank you. Bye-bye. Bye-bye. <laughs>